This is Jason Kanigan, the president of Cold Star Technologies. Let me begin this episode by thanking our interviewer, Dr. Rick Fleeter of Brown University. I'd like to thank him and uh, also Brown University and the Space Horizons 2020 conference where this was recorded. Our interviewee is Dr. Pete Warden, who is also a retired Air Force general, had 29 years of service in the Air Force, was a director of a NASA research center and also worked uh, as a consultant with DARPA for a long time. So this is going to be a fascinating talk. Let's tune in. So I'm Rick Fleer at Space Horizons 2020. And we're doing podcasts with Pete Warden. <laughs> I had an original question for you because people haven't who've seen the podcast or listening aren't going to have heard anything that we talked about. So the first thing I want to ask you was um, basically your autobiography, your career path. Well, thank you, Rick. I'm really delighted to be here, and uh, uh, the people listening, Rick and our old friends. Uh, uh, he got me addicted to small satellites and bicycling, <laughs> so uh, I'm not sure which is more important. Uh, but uh, uh, by background, uh, I'm an old guy. I was 70 this year, so I guess I'm right in the middle of the baby boom. Uh, I was I was uh, grew up during the Apollo program in uh, in beautiful Detroit, Michigan. Uh, which actually at that time was the country's richest city, New York City, and it's not anymore. Uh, although it's it's returning, but uh, from a very young age, I think you know, in the mid '50s, uh, the first book that my mother gave me was was two of them: one about planets and one about stars. Uh, I thought the stars one was cooler because uh, it said something that there were other solar systems, and I thought ours was kind of boring because there were like no scary aliens or anything exciting here. Uh, but at any rate, uh, I, you know, the Apollo program uh, began in the early 60s. And uh, I, like probably a lot of my colleagues, uh, you know, wanted to, to be an astronaut. I wanted to go to the moon. And, and uh, so uh, I you know, ended up in 1967 uh, going to the University of Michigan, a great university, go blue, by the way. Uh, my sister and my mom right there. And, uh, the, uh, uh, and majored in astronomy. And the interesting thing is, uh, you know, I figured, well, space and astronomy, that should be the, the, the same. Uh, and it turned out there were uh, 120 people in the introductory astronomy course for majors, a uh, very popular program, but in the end of us, six of us ended up getting a degree in astronomy because uh, you quickly discover that, you know, among other things, it requires lots of math. <laughs> right. And uh, it turned out two of us ended up getting a PhD, and I think I'm probably the only one still doing space work. Uh, but uh, I was also uh, recognized that... That's in, amazing attrition. It is amazing. <laughs> but, I, but I also recognized that uh, many of the astronauts were, uh, were military. And my father was a former military pilot. And he said, well, why don't I uh, join the Air Force? And I kind of like, ooh, you know, you join the Air Force. <laughs> but but I, I was persuaded because it got me out of gym. <laughs> and and uh, so the, uh, but one thing led to another. And Was it Air Force? Air Force ROTC. ROTC at, yeah. at, uh, and uh, so in 1971, I graduated. And I was originally supposed to be a combat pilot. And uh, it turned out that the Vietnam War was winding down. Uh, so, uh, you know, I went after my, you know, really primary interest and in, uh, the Air Force allowed me to go to graduate school and get a doctorate in astronomy, uh, which I did at the University of Arizona, uh, finishing my PhD in 1975. Uh, and there were a number of different possibilities. Uh, I was offered a, a postdoc at Harvard. Uh, which I almost took, but uh, it turned out. Something in observatory, that type. Of at, at, at the uh, it's now the Center for Astrophysics. Okay. Oh it yeah. Was okay. In solar physics, because uh, my dissertation was a, was a solar physics one, and uh, but the other option was I could go on active duty in the Air Force, which I did, uh, and it, uh, I got assigned to the National Solar Observatory, which the Air Force had part of. And a great job was at a, the last remaining residential observatory in the United States, meaning all the staff lives at the observatory. It was 9,200 feet up in the mountains of New Mexico. Uh, I ended up, uh, uh, there, were, there were nine single guys and one single uh, young lady. Uh, uh, she was a librarian, and I, and I won. I end up marrying her. Uh, although she says, don't get too, you know, too proud of yourself. The other eight of them were pretty geeky. So she said, it was only in comparison. 
but uh, at, at any rate, that I uh, decided I was, you know, I had a choice of going on in the Air Force or or uh, going to academia. So I moved to Los Angeles and uh, spent. Uh, uh, I was in a military assignment at what's now the the, uh, the well, I guess Los Angeles Air Force Base. I think they have a new name. But uh, uh, I also had a faculty position at UCLA in astronomy. But one thing led to another, and uh, you know I got involved in uh, the Star Wars program, the missile defense program that Ronald Reagan did. Uh, I got promoted early to major. Uh, I was also a finalist to become uh, an astronaut during that period. I didn't get selected, so I kind of hate astronauts. I'm jealous. And uh, but uh, I ended up spending 29 years in the Air Force. Uh, had several tours at the White House, uh, working for the Science Advisor and the and, and also another time the National Space Council. Uh, and uh, I retired in uh, 2003 as a Brigadier General. And uh, I'd caused a lot of trouble. I actually got fired by the President. But that's a long story. Uh, but uh, I don't think I knew that. Story. Yeah, that's and uh, the uh, it's I ran something called the Office of Strategic Influence, which was running the information war after 9/11, and we got accused of doing disinformation, which was rubbish, but it was politically, you know, death. So I, I, I got thrown out of the Air Force, basically. But being thrown out as a general isn't too bad. Uh, I spent two years on, as a, as a, on the faculty at the University of Arizona. Uh, and then I was uh, in the shortlist to be the NASA administrator. They ended up hiring uh, my best friend, Mike Griffin. And, uh, you know, I finally went to see him, and he uh, said he wanted me to come and work with him. And uh, I said, work at NASA? Are you kidding? I think NASA is horrible. <laughs> I'd written an article that said that right, Na right. <laughs> NASA is a self-looking ice cream cone and that NASA stands for never a straight answer. He said, well, stop complaining. You know, come and help us fix it. So. I ended up being the uh, director at one of NASA's centers, the NASA Ames Research Center, and was there for nine years. Really great place. Uh, we did uh, uh, a number of lunar missions. And uh, we had the Kepler mission, which is, I think, the most exciting. It showed that, that essentially every star in the galaxy has a solar system, which is amazing. what I suspected since amazing. I was five years old. Right. And, uh, and about a quarter of the stars, like the sun, seem to have an Earth-sized planet, uh, you know, in the habitable zone. So, you know, there's a lot of places Why that... Why is that? Because all the stars are basically in the same physics when they're well, born and they throw off mass I, that's in that's a good question. Light. Nobody is... I'm, well, I, I'm not a theoretical, uh, you know, stellar dynamics guy. And some of them would say they know how come planets form, but it turns out every time we observe things, they were completely wrong. And so I don't think we know. It's a very complicated process, but it seems to happen a lot. Uh, I think uh, one thing about the universe is there are hi hierarchical, you know, sequences that you know that uh, you know. It's kind of like the old story about you know fleas have fleas inside them to bite them, and uh, so that you know galaxies have stars, stars have. You know, planets. Uh, planets have moons, and maybe we'll find a moon that has a moon. So, uh, but it's uh, at any rate. Uh, I, you know, I was the basically the senior civil servant in Silicon Valley, U.S. government employee, and uh, ended up getting, uh, uh, you know, uh, invited to A-list uh, billionaire parties, <laughs> and kind of for comic relief, I think. Uh, but uh, uh, you know, but I don't. Those guys. Or many of them are technologists. Well, yeah, I think it's interesting that this crop of high net worth people in America are te technically. I mean, we really shouldn't whine about them so much. No, no, they're, they're all kind of they're like us. Th right? That's right. They're they're they're, they're, guys. We're just jealous. They're richer right. <laughs> by quite a lot. But uh, uh, they mostly were smart enough to not stay in school as long as we well. Did. Well, they they grew up on Star Trek and Star Wars, and, and they like I were 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 kind of felt cheated that. When we grew up, we thought we were going to end up taking vacations to the moon and living on Mars. And and uh, interesting thing is that I felt that we should be working with them. And some of them very much think the same way. And, you know, Bezos and Musk are two of the most uh, noteworthy. But I eventually met Yuri Milner, who is a Russian-Israeli billionaire, who was a physicist. And, and his big interest was uh, life in the universe, which has been my big scientific interest. It, can we answer the fundamental question, are we alone? 
and he's put several hundred million dollars into this question. And uh, so that's my primary job. I uh, uh, we're looking for three main things. Uh, first of all, is uh, uh, can we find any evidence for life uh, anywhere? Uh, we're looking both in our solar system and in nearby solar systems. Second is can we find any evidence for intelligent life? And I have to always say that uh, you know that always begs the question: Is there intelligent life here? And uh, what do you I'm, mean by intelligent? Yeah, yeah, well, I'm fond of saying the closer you get to Washington or London or Beijing, there isn't any. But but uh, the uh, uh, but at any rate, that's uh, you know we have a hundred million dollar program to look for signals. Uh, the third question is probably the most interesting to me: is can we travel between the stars? And uh, uh, because that has a big bearing on did life come from elsewhere? You know, was life planted here? Uh, this is the so-called Fermi paradox that fundamentally says that, that if there isn't anything unique about the Earth and it's not a terribly old star, uh, there must be lots of, us. lots of stars that are older that have had life and it's evolved to intelligence and it may be far more advanced. And Fermi's question was, where are they? And uh, you know, barring you know a few people with too many things to drink or other right. drugs, nobody's, nobody's uh, I've never seen, seen any. Right. No convincing evidence of right. any of those guys. That was actually leads me to the next question, my little list of questions, which is all these interesting things that people know about breakthrough. You know, people know about the Al Centauri mission, or they know about the listening mission. But what's the? I mean, you're almost said it, but just to bring it out, what's it all about with them? I mean, what's the you know one-line value proposition of breakthrough? Well, I'm a scientist, and uh, there are big science questions. To me, the biggest of all is the is the three-word question: Are we alone? And it's about trying to answer that. And I think we've got a chance of doing that in the next few years, mm, in some way or other. And which of the three? I guess if it's in the next few years, it's not going to be. I mean. Is Starshot really a way to find life, or is it just a first step to proving to ourselves that we can go there? Well, there's, there, 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 there are different parts of the same. Uh, it, you know, I mean, NASA calls these the astrobiology questions, is, is what was the origin of life, uh, where else is it, and what is the future of life? And I, I think these are the same questions. And uh, I think certainly the question of is there life elsewhere, uh, we're going to start getting an answer this decade. You know, we're, I think we're going to find, is there life in our solar system? Uh, and I think we're going to find, are there things that are obviously life-bearing planets orbiting the nearby stars? And I think we're going to do it this decade. And the, now the next question is, is there intelligent life? I mean, that's... And what uh, about in the solar system, which isn't as hard? I mean, well, I'm not sure the solar system isn't. I mean, I said obvious life. I mean, the Earth has obvious life. Yeah. And it's obvious in the sense that there are chemicals that would be visible at interstellar distances like chlorophyll, photosynthetic pigments. Uh, there are gases in the Earth's atmosphere at high concentration that are, that are non-equilibrium gases, which means that if, if something doesn't make them all the time, they will be destroyed by natural processes. We don't see any evidence of either a non-equilibrium gas or some large you know, molecular signal that's clearly, uh, you know, complex enough to be organic doesn't mean it's not there, but it, it says that our solar system isn't, you know, you know, rife with life everywhere. I mean, there's no, you know, beautiful blondes from Betelgeuse on Mars, right. you know, and uh, there's no, you know, uh, you know, cloud creatures on Jupiter that, uh, or, you know, you know, we, we you know, find you know mer, mer people living in the oceans of Venus, because the oceans of Venus have been gone for two billion years. Right, so if we found something, it's likely to be fairly simple and form an eye. But still, it would be important. But How, however, you know, there's, I, you know, there's within five parsecs, about 15 light years, uh, some 50 star systems. And uh, we know some of them already have Earth-sized planets orbiting them. And, uh, you know, I think we're going to get data on the atmospheres of those with the next generation of large ground-based telescopes and even better data with the next generation of space telescopes that we'll build in early in the 30, uh, 2030s. And uh, uh, this data may tell us, is there large-scale life under these planets? 
so that's uh, there's kind of a race to whether we'll find you know microbial life in our solar system or or uh, large scale you know uh, life on another uh, nearby star. I mean, this is a little bit off my questioning, but if we didn't find anything, you know how people are. Like, it's not going to take very long of not finding things. So people are going to say, okay, they're not finding anything. I don't well, want to keep throwing resources. It almost happened to SETI, right? I mean, it just about shut down until you guys came. Well, the, the interesting thing about it. SETI, and I prefer the word techno signatures, is that in principle, a technological civilization uh, could make itself visible at much larger distances. And so... The, yeah, what well, you guys propose to do that. Yeah, so we're doing for the first really systematic, you know, we're going to try to look at all the million nearest stars for radio signals. And that's out to about a thousand light years. So that's a, you know, it's, it's a small segment. It's a fraction of percent of the galaxy, but it's still a lot of, a lot of places. Uh, and it's, uh, you know, the, the third one, Starshot, is really related to the future of life as much as... You know, I mean, if we really want to, if we find a planet that's kind of suspicious uh, orbiting one of the nearby stars, you're really going to need to study it up close and personal. And uh, but in a longer run, this technology uh, eventually could lead to the, our ability to plant life there. So if we find in our studies over the next half century or century or so that there really, as far as we can tell, we are alone, that raises the issue. Uh, you know, maybe. Uh, Maybe we should think about that, you know, that that we have a mission, <laughs> and you know, and, and I, I, I think it was uh, Schrodinger, it might have been Fermi, that I think it was Schrodinger that said that that life was the universe's answer to entropy. That that you know, there's the you know, physicists say that the, you know, the expanding entropy is the sort of heat death of the universe. Uh, you know. It, it, the universe is getting more and more lifeless, or, but you know, more disordered. Uh, but life, at least locally, reverses that entropy. So it may be that we are the universe's answer to entropy. And if we don't find anything else, then uh, that was a very interesting philosophy. I think it was Arthur C. Clarke that said, "Whatever the answer is, it's terrifying." <laughs> <laughs> well, as the thermodynamicist Prigogine got the Nobel Prize for self-organizing yeah. structures, among them biology. And just like you say, it's a local effect, but I always think the Earth is sort of that. Yeah. We're a very low entropy spot in an otherwise high entropy, you know, kind of galaxy with not much order in it. Um, not to sort of get into warring billionaires, but if you compare Yuri with Elon, I, I feel like one of Elon's strengths is that he's leveraged NASA, let's say, in terms of SpaceX, not talking about Tesla or any of the other things, but it's been criticized of him that he didn't really do all this himself. He, the number has come out, $2 billion worth of NASA resources put at his disposal to help build these rockets. Yuri doesn't seem to have taken that approach. And these missions that are super resource intensive, is he trying to get NASA to you know, kind of match his investment? Well, well uh, is there uh, an amplification? Uh, uh, there? there are two questions there, and I'll answer the, both of them. The first one is, you know, that everybody loves to have warring billionaires. <laughs> you know, in, 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 in fact, in, in fact all, 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 all of my experience is that, that these people are extraordinarily uh, uh, collegial. Yeah. And, uh, and, Even Elon? Well, I mean, uh, Yuri was an investor in SpaceX early on, and and uh, you know, I know both Elon and Yuri very well. I, I, I mean, in many ways, uh, they're both visionaries. Uh, the second point is about working with uh, with partners. Uh, we're doing that, and uh, indeed, we've been considering a, a, a larger mission in our solar system to look for life. And uh, that mission will very definitely be in cooperation with NASA and in some sort of partnership. Uh, already, our programs with uh, you know the National Science Foundation is a major partner. Uh, we've got some small spacecraft. We're about ready to work. That you know that that groups, uh, both government and private, in Australia and in Germany, uh, and in the U.S. Uh, other than us, are working on. So, I think all of these things are a partnership, and it's uh, one of the key things that I found about high net worth people is none of them made all of their money by being loners. They all work very collegially with, well, maybe. 
competitively, but also, but uh, you know, with other groups, uh, and uh, you know, so I, I I know the public loves to you know have you know yeah, yeah. The, I mean it's like some movie that you're you know, always looking for scandal, you're looking for some backstabbing, you know, you know but but <laughs> it's it's really uh, you know when I, I mean they my experience has been that uh, they. Uh, uh, they gather quite frequently, quite quickly. In fact, the other thing that that Yuri started was the uh, was the Breakthrough Prize, which is the right. largest prizes in science. Uh, uh, Three million dollars in life sciences, physics, and mathematics, and it's like six or seven prizes. Uh, those are very collegial. The the sponsors of those are a number of of, of billionaires, both in and out of the U.S. Uh, and at our uh, at our conference, uh, we had Elon has been one of the presenters. And uh, uh, so of other high net worth people, uh, so it's it's a you know I think it's a that that it, it, it really is a, something that I mean the idea of public private partnerships is is a long standing history. I mean, and it go, if you want to talk about philanthropic science, I can go back to one of the earliest big philanthropic science uh, efforts in the U.S. the uh, the Lick Observatory. Uh, Lick Observatory, in, in modern terms, was probably a billion and a half dollars, and it was the richest man in California. Uh, but to, to do that, he asked for the the, the state, the local governments, to to build the road up the uh -huh. the, the mountain, and uh, which they did, and they maintain. And uh, now that observatory and others that are five, privately funded, like Keck. Uh, the, the telescope may have been privately built, but the operations and science is funded, you know, publicly. So uh, these are all very collegial uh, activities. Because I can kind of see two advantages. One is part of his vision could be more realized if he could leverage other people's money. Because even though he has a lot of money, it isn't enough money to do certain things that are pretty ambitious. And then, but the other thing is, I'd really like to see him influence NASA's agenda. Right. Which, by partnering him, I mean, you're kind of setting the agenda. Yeah, yeah, we're, we're working on that. I guess that's all I can say. <laughs> okay. Because this occurs to yeah. me, you could be a force for good in the world by, you know, well, Mr. adding a new voice to what, you know, NASA decision-making on what their agenda is. Mr. Milner is very on board in that and, and is very anxious. We, we've had a, a series of meetings with the heads of science, most of the world space agencies. and. And we're very, very much looking at at, at uh, collaborative projects, and, and so I think that's uh, it's, yeah, it's we're spot both on. Working, we're both working in Europe now, and I can, my experiences with ESA, they're very hard to redirect at all. NASA may be a little more responsive actually than some of the other agencies. Out well, there. even ESA has been helpful, and we've had discussions with them. We certainly are working with uh, uh, national space agencies, and uh, uh, quite successfully. Do you think that? Um, this is my own personal question. I'm a little bit off, but we have a little bit of time. You know, I really believe, and I think Van, Von Braun believed, that the chemical rocket, as much as it's done for us, was kind of like, well, this is the best thing we can come up with given the tools that I've got at this point in history, and we're in a big rush to get to the moon, so let's do it. But, you know, breakthrough is one of the few things that's not using chemical rocket as a primary propulsion, and NASA hasn't been very enthusiastic about anything having to do with. I mean, maybe the Air Force a little bit more open. Do you ever see that that part of Starshot becoming part of the NASA agenda to have an alternative propulsion system for in space propulsion? Well, I, I think it's important to say that, you know, again, you know, NASA, of course, is extraordinarily overcommitted on their uh, yeah. funds. <laughs> now they have a lot of wedges. <laughs> but, but, they, but they did uh, a couple of years ago, and they were urged to do so by members of the Congress started a program to look at interstellar flight and look at laser-driven light sails, and also fusion, uh, which is another interesting possibility. And so I think... Uh, uh, so there's, a, there's an upper aperture there uh, to possibly get some... Uh, I, I, exactly, and I think that, you know, we are, uh, uh, in our Starshot program, the laser-driven light sail, we already have a number of partners uh, in, uh, you know, various centers, uh, that uh, uh, research centers both in and outside the U.S. and they put in, you know, one of the things we ask is a contribution from our partner. And so and we have to judge, is it enough? But that's one of the criteria for selection. 
And uh, you know, I mean, there are some efforts that you know that uh, that NASA is co-funding, often in kind. And we've signed agreements with NASA on some of our projects. Uh, uh, you know, I mean, they're they're not in the you know millions of dollars yet, but eventually they could be. Right, right. And it's, it's all progress incremental with the agency. Um, all right, I have an, actually a question that's on my agenda, which is. Um, about this relevance thing that the conference is about today. Because I think you probably agree that Apollo was incredibly, I mean, Mercury, Gemini, Apollo, that whole series of 50 missions that led up to the landing, was incredibly relevant. Some Americans, maybe 50% or more, didn't get it. There was a lot of resistance to it. But it was addressing a major concern of Americans at the time, which was the Cold War. The Cold War, we, now we look at it in sort of an ironic way as if we were just living in, a, we were afraid of a ghost. But I don't think having both of us lived through it, it wasn't a ghost. It was a real Cold War. It was an adequate name, I think. The and ghost a, was very capable. <laughs> and Apollo was the yeah. right answer in a way. It wasn't a military, like you say, a lot of military is, you know, appearance and convincing. And this was highly convincing, though nobody, you know, nobody got shot at. So, you know, what's the relevant mission right now? That's what this conference is really about, is can space be more than, I mean, it's relevant to do science, and the people who've spoken to the conference today, I have no, you know, I like that stuff, personally. But what I see, you know, the dull thud that gets out in the general public of, you know, that's very nice, and you guys are interested in pat on the head, and great job on Chandra or whatever, but people aren't glued to their televisions. Well, I, th I think the, uh, uh or to their and I'll probably answer this in a fairly long-winded way, but you know, a good friend of mine, Rick Tumlinson, who I think you know yeah, as well, yeah, yeah. Uh, a few years ago, uh, you know, he identified what he called three different tribes of of views on space, and uh, uh, he named them after famous people that that kind of he thought typified them. The, the first tribe he named after Werner von Braun, and he called them von Braunians. And he said they were basically motivated by, you know, national pride and nationalism and, uh, and national power. Now, he points out that von Braun changed who that was mid-career, but the... the, 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 the uh, yeah, he changed That happens. That happens. I mean, it's, uh, there was a, there was a, a, a forced trade hey, of, from of, of players. <laughs> we lost LeBron. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And uh, uh, the... Uh, uh, and, and I think that still is a strong motivation. And it was a motivation for, frankly, our generation. Was, uh, you know, uh, it was a competition between nations uh, by other, you know, nonviolent means. Uh, the second uh, key tribe he identifies is those that are inspired by human knowledge, by science. And, uh, uh, and he names after Carl Sagan, who I think was an articulate advocate and uh, he calls them Saganites. And, uh, you know, certainly, I mean, people can be more than one, but I'd say that, that much of the, you know, the space science effort, both in the U.S. and outside it, is, is motivated by it's answering these fundamental questions yep. that may not have any real value. Uh, the third one is, uh, you know, a little more nebulous, but I would say that it's, uh, and he calls it uh, the O'Neillians, named after O'Neill. And, uh, you know, he says that the O'Neillians are, are uh, those that are, that are interested in space colonies and expansion. I would say they're more interested in practical solutions to problems. So the, the new space. New, uh, new space, but they're also interested in expanding humanity, expanding human presence and human capabilities. And among that is using space to fix the planet. And, 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 and where I see, uh, uh, you know, a major uh, uh, overlap there is that that uh, I'm quite interested in. You know, there was this experiment done 25 years ago, the Biosphere Two, at right, at, uh, right, which NASA didn't really get behind. Right, it was a private sector effort, uh, just like uh, Bezos and others are. But it it has a objective of of showing that you know how do you manage with a closed loop system. Right. And, you know, could you make a closed loop system that people could live in? And one of the intents was to have settlements and expansion into space. 
And uh, uh, the interesting thing they found out was that it's extraordinarily hard to close a system and to manage it. But it becomes quite feasible if you are able to bring in a few things from outside and, and uh, maybe exhaust a few things that you don't want. And uh, so if we can, I mean, the earth is just a biosphere. And uh, I think that this is what motivating people like Bezos and others, and, and I think a lot of the young people is, if we consider the earth as an open system, we can use space as a, uh, as, as a, as a way to manage our planet. Bring things and, and take I mean, you know, Bezos, too, yeah, be, yeah, yeah, Bezos would say that, uh, well, I'm gonna take heavy industry off the planet, and it makes it a lot easier to manage, a, you know, good on you. Uh, Musk would say, you know, having a new set of options for humanity on Mars is also, it, it, it's a safety valve. Now, I think there's a fourth view, in fact, a colleague of mine and I are writing a book on it, which uh, I'll name after Arthur C. Clarke, you know, who was one of my mentors and friends. Both of us. <laughs> and and uh, uh, I'd say that's really a cultural issue that says that the cultural richness of what we are as humans is enhanced, or even mandates a continued expansion into new options and new, you know, new discoveries. And uh, it's not just science or practical, you know, solving the Earth's problems or, you know, making you know America great. Uh, you again. know, well, or whenever, <laughs> again and again. Uh, we've been great for a long time, and you know, I think we'll continue to be. But the. But it's a, uh, uh, you know, this is a, this is a, uh, uh, you know, I think, uh, you know, particularly the O'Neill view, and I think the Arthur C. Clarke view, as I call it, uh, are what appeals to the, the generation that have, you know, are attending this meeting. Mm -hmm. But it's just, in a way, progress. But we're not living our grandfather's world. Right. In fact, we are the grandfathers now, so they're not living. They're not. They're not living ours. Yet. Right. Right. So, to me, there's two new spaces out there, you know, that are competing for relevance. One is the new space we call new space, with all these entrepreneurs trying to do mining in space, or manufacturing in space, or tourism in space. Businesses that, in a capitalistic model, are self-replicating because they're generating profit. Right. And then there's another kind of new space, which is... Cultural, I think. Right. I mean, it's what Yuri and company are doing. Right. And, right? And, and some of them overlap. I mean, I certainly think that, that you know, that Bezos is a little bit of both. Uh, and Musk is obviously a little bit of both. But uh, increasingly, I, I, I think that, that this generation is going to be more interested in, you know, certainly both the practical and the cultural aspects. Well, to me, what I see in students is the fact that very wealthy people feel that they're going to make investments, right, and either make money in space or move the civilization off the planet. That were really there was tremendous interest in the lunar city when we did that. There's a certain amount of interest in this idea of having people living in space, either on the moon base or whatever. So I think you be right. Those are the two things. So the relevance, but of course, fixing the Earth. To me, that was the driver for the conference. Was that's the most relevant thing we could do because we're not all moving off the earth. So is that going to happen? I mean, in your this is kind of my wrap-up question. After seeing and you know thinking about it, is space going to save the planet? Is that really what's going to happen in the end? Because uh, I don't see it that we on the planet are saving the planet. Well, either space saves the planet or it's not going to be saved. Uh, that's I mean, what I, mean. <laughs> <laughs> that's I, I you know I think that you know I'm that hard over on it. I I think we're you know the. Uh, that, that clearly, you know, increasing, you know, technology and population and standard of living and say that we just can't manage on this planet with, you know, seven, eight, ten billion people, you know, all living in a lifestyle that's even what ours is. And uh, so if we don't use space to, uh, at the minimum, as a safety valve and eventually as a way to manage and expand, uh, the options, uh, there isn't going to be a future. It's going to be extraordinarily uh, catastrophic. You know, dystopian, I believe, is the word that people use. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, and I, and I, you know, I think that, you know, hopefully people at this conference and others will begin to see that, 
that. Uh, so, given that, what about the NASA agenda? Does NASA see its role as safety leader? Because well, I had a frustration, and maybe I was naive. I don't see it in two ways. I don't see it in journalism. I don't even see it at Brown. I don't see that the most important thing we have to do right now is solve this problem. It's a peripheral problem. The New York Times will do a climate article every so often, but it's not front and center. And I don't see it front and center in NASA well, either. I'm wondering maybe I'm just missing it, or maybe there's not that well, much Well, this, this is, you know, I mean, I, I mean, I worked for NASA for almost a decade. You know, uh, uh, you know, I, I really love the agency, love the people, and love what we're doing. But you know, the the agency is part of a government, and uh, is part of the government. It responds to the pressures and and opportunities that. The government has, and it, uh, you know, I think it's it uh, that, you know, it is a clearly having been there for almost a decade. It is a, uh, it it is a clash of these objectives, and uh, you know, to date, I'd say probably the, you know, over half the budget is is uh, dominated by the von Brownings, right? And uh, and I'd say that you know probably, uh, you know the. The majority of the rest of it's dominated by the Saganites, and it's a small minority that that uh, of the, the O'Neills, and it's an even smaller minority that are Clarkians, if I use it. And uh, you know, so that you see the resources are, you know, it's uh, you know one of my big concerns has always been is that the you know the, the piglets get trampled by the hogs on the way to the trough, and uh, you know the uh, you know the hogs have gotten pretty big. And uh, uh, so, you know, there's two options. You can go try to change it from inside, which is hard, I can tell you. And the system tends to, you know, develop antibodies. And, uh, uh, or you can find new resources. And uh, right, that's I, what I see people like Yuri and, and, is and, possibly and, doing. And that's my question and, about how relevant. Well, I think NASA is very relevant. I mean, I'm not saying that the, the you know, the, the existing majority of what they're doing is wrong. It's just not where my focus is. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, you know, I, I, I'd certainly say there are a large number of very loyal, excited people at NASA that are interested in these latter two, uh, maybe more than they know. Uh, certainly when I was at NASA Ames, I'd say, you know, the, the, at least half the center was focused more on, the, on these later things. Mm -hmm. Uh, but not without controversy, and you know. But the uh, and one of the things I really, uh, you know, I'm not a Marxist, but I love the, uh, you know, Marx, uh, you know, talked about the, you know, the Hegelian dialectic. That uh, there's a thesis and an antithesis, and out of the clash of them comes a fusion and a new synthesis. And so I think that's what's happening. And NASA is just another example. Of that. Okay. Well. We did, I did my first podcast, right, except right. that I do most of mine myself yeah, for, right. my, for my classes. No, no, that's, that, that's, so I guess I did my first interview. Super. Well, well thank you, Rick. And, uh, thanks for doing Hopefully it. the recorder worked, or maybe it didn't. <laughs> yeah, maybe for the better if it didn't. Okay, thanks a lot. I'm going to click the off button.